Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you, including Pele Glendale, Tim Deputy, Brandon Brooks, and everybody welcome our brand new patron, David, 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 David. yay. New patrons are the best. On this episode of DTNS, you can control the Apple Vision Pro with your mind. Amazon speeds up rural delivery and why RCS on iOS might be a bigger deal for business than anybody else. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, July 30th, 2024. I'm in Los Angeles, but I am also Tom Merritt. I'm in Los Angeles, too, at Studio Animal House, and my name's Sarah Lane. My name is Roger Chang, and I am this show's producer. <laughs> and joining us, the CEO of Yes More and Company, Brett Rounceville. Welcome! Hey, thanks for having hey, me. I'm in Brett. Oakland, California. How is Oakland How these that? days? Uh, it's pretty good. Right now, we're having uh, what I like to think of as optional summer, where mm -hmm. it's like 50 degrees and foggy in the mornings, and then <laughs> optionally 70 and sunny afternoons. Oh, yeah. So if you just stay indoors, you miss summer. It's, yeah. it's, only, it's only there for part of the day. Uh, well, the right it time. turns out that Apple uh, has been renting Google's tensor processing units to train Apple intelligence, not NVIDIA. Let's see what else is in the rest of the quick hits. OpenAI began rolling out the advanced voice mode that it showcased in a demo back in May. You might remember this mode because a lot of people said it sounded a whole lot like the actress Scarlett Johansson. But it also has the capability to be interrupted and respond with a little bit of lag. The launch was delayed while more than 100 people worked on finding ways to misuse it so that OpenAI could then mitigate those. As a result, there are new filters to strengthen the block on malicious requests for things like generating music and copyrighted audio. There will be four voices, and OpenAI says they've made it so that the tool can't impersonate other people's voices, at least not as well as it did before. The rollout is a subset, uh, rolling out to a subset of paying users, and will reach all ChatGPT Plus users by this fall. The United States Senate has passed COSA, the Kids Online Safety Act, obviously meant for goats, and COPA, the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, also known as COPA 2.0, 91-3. Those bills are now headed to the U.S. House. Now, they passed 91-3 to uh, in the Senate, so you would think... Well, they've got a chance of just sailing through the House, but apparently not. It is unclear if these two will pass the House. The laws apply to children younger than 16. Under COSA, social media companies must offer user controls to disable algorithmic feeds and any other features that are deemed addictive. The rules are specific in the law. And it creates a duty of care. That's the big thing that says that Prevention of harmful effects are the responsibility of the platform. Opposition to COSA includes a concern that while it doesn't specifically censor speech, that that duty of care causes a chilling effect where companies are going to filter speech not explicitly prohibited just to be on the safe side. COPA is a little less controversial. It revises the 1998 version of the law to prohibit companies from targeting advertisers uh, at users' aged 13 to 16 without consent, and it adds the requirement for an erase button that you can press to delete all your personal data if you are, again, aged 13 through 18. Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon 4S Gen 2 chipset, which is cheap enough to bring 5G capability to sub $100 phones. For those who are following the space, the 4S is a feature limited version of the 4 Gen 2. It doesn't support all 5G bandwidths, just standalone service, which is currently offered in India by Geo and coming soon from Airtel. Outdoor wear company Arcturix has partnered with a company called Skip on the Mogo Pants. They include a lightweight electric motor at the knee to help boost your strength when you're hiking uphill and reduce impact on the knee during descent. The pants weigh around seven pounds. Uh, they have removable, rechargeable batteries that last about three hours, so you're not hiking for more than that before you recharge. But an algorithm in the device monitors how the wearer walks to provide the right kind of assistance. So you actually feel lighter wearing these pants, not heavier. Pre-orders are available with a $99 deposit, but uh, gird yourself. That locks in the early bird discount 
of $4,500 for the pants. Uh, if that's a little too rich for your blood, Arcteryx is also renting them at select trails in the U.S. and Canada for 80 bucks. You know, at first I thought seven pounds of pant, but they say you can feel up to 30 pounds lighter overall. Yeah, right. It's so 23 pound net. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a hike to boot. Yeah. Uh, Meta settled a Texas lawsuit over its collection of facial recognition data without permission between 2010 and 2021. Meta will pay Texas $1.4 billion over five years. Meanwhile, Meta's AI studio is now available to all users in the U.S. to create personalized chatbots. The bots work across Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and the web. Examples of use cases is chatting with a fan if you're a creator and you're not available or you're just getting too many messages you can create captions for videos or generate creator specific specific means as well. All right. Let's talk brain computer interfaces. This is a pretty hot area, and Synchron is the latest company to tout one of their advances. Synchron announced Tuesday that it has successfully connected its BCI to an Apple Vision Pro. So patients with the Synchron implant are able to control the headset with their thoughts. A patient with ALS named Mark has had the Synchron implant since August 2023, and he began testing using it with the Vision Pro during doctor's appointments starting back in April. He says he can control it to send texts, play solitaire, and watch TV. Uh, says he can use it for up to two hours without his neck getting tired. Uh, and luckily, he doesn't get motion sick. Uh, Mark's use is meant to test it for a larger scale clinical trial where we'd see more people trying to use it. Uh, Brett, what do you think about the idea? You know, obviously, this is for medical use, but being able to, you know, control a virtual headset with your thoughts. I mean, I am all for the medical use case, uh, not needing the medical use case. I, I just don't have a use for someone shoving a wire in my jugular vein. Maybe? Yeah, uh, no brain surgery. That's the positive for this. But if you did need to get the Synchron implant, uh, they guide it through your jugular vein into your motor cortex to the to the blood vessel sitting right over the motor cortex. Uh, and then they put an antenna in your chest. And so it connects to the antenna wirelessly, and then the antenna wirelessly connects to the Vision Pro. Like you do. I mean, for as somebody who I don't have ALS um, or a, a real medical need for this, um, I you know setting that aside for a second, those who do, this is amazing. Um, obviously, the Apple Vision Pro is the example that we're using, but the idea that someone with limited motor skills uh, can do a lot of stuff. I mean. Uh, sending text, playing solitaire and watching TV. Obviously that's not what you're going to do all day, every day with your life. You want to do things other than that, but that can, that means a lot of information and communication and fun. And to be able to have a way to do that. I don't know how totally seamless it is, but if it, if it works, I think people like Mark are, you know, they're, they're, they, they have more options than ever before. And that is a good thing. A non-medical way to say, well, down the road, um, you know, and a lot of accessibility stuff starts this way. It, accessibility features are almost always designed for someone who has a very specific need for something that the rest of us can do that they cannot. Um, and sometimes that accessibility option turns into just a really cool feature to do things differently, even if you are uh, abled in a, in a way that it was not necessarily designed for. So doing stuff with my thoughts down the road with a headset or smart glasses or, you know, a variety of electronics. I'm all for it. I still don't really understand how it works because I'm like, my thoughts are all over the place. Aren't I just going to screw it up? Because, you know, that's <laughs> what our brains do. But there's more to it than that. Yeah. I mean, your thoughts are all over the place, but your arms don't waggle wildly all the time, right? You're able to control yeah. them. And so that's, that's kind of the way these things work is – they detect very particular uh, impulses and you train your, you do have to train yourself to understand, oh, when I think this way, the way I would normally use to raise my arm, for example, that registers in the motor cortex and I can register it as, you know, move, move uh, the motion sensor as if I were moving my arm. But in, in fact, Mark says he can't lift his arms to paint anymore, uh, but he likes to paint. Uh, and so he's learning how to use the Vision Pro to create art because he can lift a brush by, um, I guess, sort of imagining that he is lifting his arm. And then that 
is read to the Apple Vision Pro. The the electric impulses of that are read to the Apple Vision Pro as uh, that's an arm lift, lift the brush. It's pretty crazy. His personal story is inspiring. The idea that he is getting all this added uh, ability that he didn't have before, absolutely incredible. Yeah, uh, he apparently has been trying the iPhone and the iPad uh, with the BCI and says that the Apple Vision Pro is not much different. Uh, as far as like being able to train yourself to think and use it. He says some apps are more challenging than others, but I think that kind of goes for everybody who's used the Apple Vision Pro, right, Sarah? Yeah, uh, very much so. Um, this is... Th these sorts of stories are, you know, this is a, we're, this is a um, very specific person who's had very specific success with both a Synchron, um, uh, you know, tech and the Apple Vision Pro. So I, I assume mileage will vary person to person. But it's also a really good reminder as you were talking about raising your hands. It's a it's a good reminder because, of course, I think a lot of people might agree with me saying, all right, so I put on the Vision Pro and now I have to be like, open solitaire app, you know, like you like really have to think about it. But like, do I think Sarah lift arm when I do this? Well, yeah, I am thinking that that re is really what's happening first, but I don't, that's not part of the process that feels like, you know, this, you know, step one, think step yeah. two arm raises, you just yeah. do it because, and you, and we say things like muscle memory, but it's like, it's all coming from here first. Uh, wisdom in our, our push you, back. Oh, right, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to push back on the idea that my arms don't flail around constantly. I feel like <laughs> for a glass of water twice a day. Yeah. And boy, are his arms tired. <laughs> uh, uh, Wisdom in our YouTube chat asks how this is different from the accessibility already in the Vision Pro, uh, where you can control the device with eyes and sound. Uh, it is not different. It's in addition. So you can do more with the BCI. Be, and that's one of the reasons they did this on the Vision Pro first. They say they want to do it with other headsets like the Quest, but the Vision Pro had such a good accessibility platform they could take advantage of uh, that it allowed them to plot right in. So I assume they are using the eye control and the, the audio control in addition to being able to say, you know, the motion control that we can't use, let's use the BCI to do that. And then now you have a, a whole lot of tools at your disposal. At least that's the way it looks. Well, moving on to Amazon, which wants to cover 100% of the U.S. in package deliveries and even rural areas. Now, we're not quite there yet, but we're getting kind of close. Amazon announced Tuesday it's expanding its one to two day delivery capabilities to small towns and other areas that only are really serviced in that last mile by the U.S. Postal Service or USPS. The Wall Street Journal sources say that Amazon is closing in on 90 percent of reachable U.S. destinations by combining more efficient and sometimes smaller warehouses, contracted drivers, and even using local businesses, the mom and pop store, um, to choose ship from and be able to stock uh, certain items. Amazon expects the uptick in volume to offset the higher delivery costs from the fees that it charges its sellers. Basically, more volume means that Amazon wins either way. A couple notes here. Uh, the, the USPS has been raising rates and reducing pickups, not just with Amazon, but with uh, a lot of contracts that it has with shippers because uh, basically for more efficiency for the postal service, um, Amazon, uh, in certain rural areas right now, you know, people in rural areas can sometimes still get Amazon deliveries, but what happens is, is Amazon sends a bunch of stuff to the local USPS shipping area. Then they take care of that last mile. That's a contract between Amazon and the USPS, which is becoming less advantageous for Amazon. Amazon obviously is getting pretty good at this whole warehouse thing in various areas. So, so th that's kind of what's going on there. The company also had an interesting note that they said, um, you know, in certain situations during the earlier days of the pandemic, sort of peak pandemic, a lot of folks left urban areas, uh, moved into rural areas. Many people moved back. Not everybody did. So you've you've got. Uh, at least a subset of your rural people who are used to using Amazon in a way that's a little bit more immediate. Um, and, you know, they might benefit from this as well. 
Brett, uh, I you know, as, as with with Yes More and Company, I know getting things to people <laughs> is something that that you deal with. Uh, what's your take on on this idea of Amazon moving in and saying, you know what, the U.S. Postal Service does fine. We're not going to stop using them all the time, but we think we can do it faster. Yeah, we also did a lot of local delivery with Nearby, which sort of predated Yes More and Company. And I am never not impressed by the logistics uh, that Amazon has put together over the last like 14 years or so. But I have I have a lot of really mixed feelings about this because I feel like USPS is playing a really dangerous game right now. Uh, they're they're sort of mid deliver post to every address in America. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter Marshall Islands. You can put a 55 cent stamp on a letter and it'll it'll get there sooner or later and so by by saying like we're going to raise the rates on these deals where we're finishing the last mile that just means they're only taking on the harder and harder part of the job to do and eating into their efficiencies even more in my mind um i don't know how that's going to play out in the long term but it doesn't seem good for usps and that's a shame because they are an incredible service yeah, I, I, they're getting out innovated is is yeah. is one one perspective on this. Like Amazon, uh, S. Kelly twenty nine oh nine was pointing out, they're using other people uh, to deliver this. Right, they're doing contractors, which Amazon does a lot in urban areas too. Uh, but we've talked about previously using small businesses who know the area, and that's really smart to say, hey, we'll pay you a little bit to deliver stuff because maybe you're delivering already. You know, maybe it's a pizza place, or or maybe you're a flower delivery, or or something like that. And small town, you know the area, you know where people's houses are, you know the ins and outs, deliver some Amazon products too, and we'll, we'll kick you over a little money. Well, suddenly that's more efficient and that's faster than using the U.S. Postal Service, uh, which has to do everything, including the Marshall Islands, right? Like you were talking yeah. about. And they've Amazon has had a ton of practice doing this too. They've been doing it for years during peak season, Christmas and, and other holidays where they just ramp up in days because they throw all these contractors at the problem and now they're going to bring that same smarts to rural. Yeah. And yeah, I, I, Brett, if you, you've lived in rural areas before, right? Oh yeah. 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 And so have Sarah and I like the, you know, the idea I think from the outside might be like, what's the big deal? Three to five days versus two days. It's, it's less about the big deal and more about the, I, I never get the thing that everybody else talks about, right? Uh, you know, I can't get two day delivery and everybody else does. And and so just just feeling like you can get that same level of service is gonna make people feel a little better about Amazon. Yeah, I I I was sort of late to the game on Amazon as far as just using it for many staples that I now use it for. You know, I've got subscribe and save for all sorts of stuff that I've just like, at some point I need toilet paper, that kind of thing. Um, I, I had a lot of friends for years just be like, Sarah, why don't you just buy that on Amazon when I was like, I got to go to the pet store before they close type thing. And uh, you don't really know what you, uh, ha- you know, you don't, you don't, you don't need the convenience until you have it, until and then you, you can't it. go back. Yeah, yeah. 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 It, yeah. Now it's like sometimes I get something day of. Sometimes it's delivered between four and eight a.m. So I get up, I walk downstairs, I'm like, oh yeah, there's my package. Cool. I bought that last night at ten p.m. Type thing. Sometimes it's a couple of days. Sometimes I schedule my delivery. I mean, you have lots of options. The point is, it's so immediate that it really negates almost always the need for, for certain things, not everything in my life, but the need for me to be like, you know, I just need this right now. So I'm going to go down to Best Buy and get it. it. I almost never have to do anything like that. Now you might not have a local Best Buy, so that wouldn't even apply to you. But I think for, for, for people who were like, yeah, three to five days versus same day or next day delivery, what's the big deal? If you don't have it and it's not a big deal, then it isn't. But, yeah. um, but, but then once you do, you're like, well, that was pretty cool. I want to do this again next time. Yeah. I do feel like we're all kind of talking around the idea of like, what is convenience in a rural area? Because mm-hmm. like the, the actual convenience is, can I get this thing? Because I mean, having right. grown up in a very rural area, it's nothing to say like, well, we're not eating that for dinner tonight because we're not going to go to Costco until this weekend when we buy mm-hmm. our stuff for the month or whatever. Like that's a really normal rural experience and i don't think like one day versus three days really does matter that much from a like quote convenience perspective 
Yeah, it, it doesn't. I think Sarah's right, though. It doesn't until it does, right? Until you I mean, have yeah, it, yeah, right? right? So yeah. so I, I think that's where the people moving into the areas who are like, how come I can't get two-day delivery uh, do sort of influence Amazon in a way that people are like, well, you know, I'm used to if it's not at the IGA, then I ain't getting it till I drive somewhere else. It's, it's just the, the way of life. Yeah, that's fair. Well, if you're an Apple fanatic, like I am, or maybe just an Apple user, or even a non-Apple human who still likes a fun and informative show on everything going on in the Appleverse, each week on the Apple Vision Show podcast, my co-host Eileen Rivera and I talk through the latest, what we love, and even what we want Apple to do differently going forward. You can subscribe and join us at Apple Vision Show or wherever you get your pods. <laughs> Rich communication service, RCS. It's the successor to SMS. Uh, we talk a lot about how it's coming to iPhones in iOS 18. And when it does, uh, that group text with the one or two Android users on it will no longer have fuzzy videos and reactions will get sent normally in a lot of cases. But besides changing the color of your message bubble, which I actually won't do, uh, it's still going to be green, uh, <laughs> What else is going to change in your daily life? Brett, your business relies on text messaging. Uh, and it sounds to me like you're more excited about what RCS means for your business than a lot of Android and iOS group chat members are about what it's going to mean for their group chat. What, what does RCS mean for you? So, there's kind of this crazy thing that happened in America in that we skipped an entire paradigm. Our, our infrastructure was better than everywhere else in the world in a lot of ways. So a lot of the world ended up with things like WeChat and they built these entire systems on top of messaging in a way we didn't need to because we had mobile web really quickly. Uh, and it was it was great, solved all the problems we needed to solve. It solved them with some added complications though in in like some really strange ways. Like you you need to download an app and teach, a people, to, teach people to use an app and teach people to turn on notifications and things and and Messaging doesn't have that problem. When you're messaging someone, it's because you have their phone number and they will likely always have that phone number. Like people change their phone numbers less often than they change like spouses or houses or whatever. <laughs> and then there's nothing to teach them. Like once you have their phone number, you send them the message you need to send and they answer with what you need to answer. And, and the way we do things is sort of orthogonal to the way messaging is normally used in marketing. We actually do like sales over text messaging. And this opens up a whole new WeChat like paradigm in America that's native to messaging. So we get to experience this ease of use in messaging for business that we otherwise never would have gone back to because of RCS for business. It's going to, uh, outside of the you know green and blue bubbles fight, it's going to enable uh, things like carousels and uh, call to action buttons, uh, branding, analytics for businesses, which is a huge thing that SMS uh, does not give you uh, through like read receipts and things. And the other thing is RCS is really similar to SMS in that it is managed by the carriers. So there's an extra level of protection on top of it for the consumer. There's There's a whole... A2P registration that you have to go through as a business to even use this to begin with. Um, way too many words to say about this. So I'm going <laughs> to stop there for a second. No, no. It, explain what carousels are, because I think that's something people sure. don't realize, especially because they probably haven't seen it. Yeah, it, it's just a photo carousel on a website. But instead of uh, instead of getting like a line of a bunch of photos or something that you're getting via MMS as opposed to SMS, then you would get an actual carousel of photos so that your messaging app, your native messaging app will start to look a lot more like a mobile web in that uh, the graphics are going to look better. You're going to get high def video and photo. You're going to get in this carousel format instead of this long string of photos. Um, and I think that it's something that is going to allow for a lot of innovation and in messaging that we've been sleeping on in America. Now, immediately, I know a lot of people are going to think, okay, does this mean more spam? Is that what this mm -hmm. means? More more businesses are going to abuse the privilege? Yeah, I think that that is unlikely to be true because it's not going to be less expensive. Like businesses are still going to end up spending two to four cents to message you. And that needs to have an ROI of some kind, and which is why you get less spam on messages than you do an email anyway. 
Uh, and then, of course, there's the A2P registration where you have to do a bunch of governmental and carrier checks to even get permission to send people those messages. So I don't think it's likely that you'll see more spam. You might see more services that you have the ability to opt into, though. I think it's interesting, too, that uh, this could do for U.S. business over over messaging what we've seen businesses do in Europe on WhatsApp, what we definitely see Chinese businesses do on WeChat. Yeah. Do you think it ends up preventing us from having the super app develop? Is it another reason we wouldn't need it? I mean, well, we're never going to get the super app anyway. Our, our phones <laughs> are the You can click over to another app and, and solve your problems without living inside the app. I think that WeChat is a very unique thing and we won't be exactly WeChat, but we're going to have a similar paradigm shift in that like, I don't know, just as a, for, for instance, like Pindodo in China ran primarily on WeChat in the early days and built up a $200 million market cap just by selling things over messaging. And that's something that we skipped out on. Yeah. Well, and, and they did it on WeChat, right? But we just never had a WeChat. So uh, right. not that this does everything that WeChat does, but it, it yeah. at least uh, it sounds like you're you're pretty excited about what it'll let you do for customers who want to hear from you. Yeah, totally. And like we, uh, at least at Yes More and Company, have, have kind of already been, I like the phrase, it's Nintendo's old phrase, lateral thinking with withered technology. We were already taking SMS and trying to use it in a different way than other people were by doing and buying uh, merchandise over SMS as opposed to like just sending people marketing texts. And I think that this just de-withers the technology a little bit. It, it allows for a couple other bonus use cases and probably more creative and interesting use cases than you would see otherwise. And it's not like there isn't RCS in the world right now. It's just that sure. RCS is mostly on Android the three carriers are all supported, the three major carriers in the US. But without that, that extraordinarily wide support, it was only more difficult to support both RCS and SMS and MMS, and everything would always fall back to SMS anyway. So now uh, you have kind of one direction to develop into, and that's exciting too. Yeah, it, I mean, I, iOS was a minority uh, of the market share, but it was a big yeah. enough minority of the market share that it was a pain to try to to se separately support it. So, uh, and they, I, they actually have their own Apple business messaging platform, which is, I mean, which would be it, a third thing to support. <laughs> to, it was their version of RCS, and uh -huh. still just, there were so many uh, like hard caps on you, yeah, made for customer service. It, it wasn't it wasn't additive in any way. Very Apple-y of them to have their own yeah. version for a while and then finally give in. Uh, all right, before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. In yesterday's GDI, Tom and Nika talked through the Twitch slump and its revenue challenges going forward. We got a lot of feedback from you. Over on Patreon, Tony commented, I think of Twitch more as a social network than a streaming service. The largest category on Twitch is just chatting, where people are doing all kinds of things other than playing games. IRL streaming, huge on Twitch. They also have shorts, but it hasn't really worked well because they only go out to the followers of the channel. Rob Bugs Life on Patreon wrote, the thing that always turned me off about Twitch was it was too focused on live streaming. They have video on demand, but they have to be done explicitly by the creator and there isn't always a lot of them per channel. Where YouTube always has their videos and I can, when I'm able, have time and can't usually watch people when they are live, watch the video on demand. Joshua in Indiana also emailed us, when Amazon first bought Twitch, you were able to use your Amazon Prime subscription to watch all of Twitch ad-free. Then they changed it to only the channels you subscribe to were ad-free. Now, even if I subscribe to a creator, I have to pay an additional fee to watch that ad-free version. Personally, not worth my money. I still try to go in every month and re-up the free subscription I'm able to give with my Prime membership, but I no longer watch anything on Twitch. So yeah, if you want the uh, the main discussion that that prompted all this, uh, go go listen to Good Day Internet on Patreon from yesterday. Uh, one of the things I said was that Twitch needs to be a lot more like TikTok. Not realizing that as I was saying that Twitch had been announcing a TikTok like carousel for their mobile yeah. app. Uh, <laughs> so it's still not TikTok videos; it's still full live videos. Uh, and my point was more about shorts and all of that. But hey, uh, it, it was it, at least they they were in that same direction that I was talking about. 
Thanks to everybody who chimes in on stuff that resonates with you. Keep that feedback coming. Feedback at DailyTechNewsShow.com. Brett Ranzeville, so nice to have you on the show today. Let folks know what is your latest and how they can keep up with you. Oh, shucks. Uh, well, you can find me personally on threads mostly as Amtrekker, A-M-T-R-E-K-K-E-R. Uh, and you can join the wait list now for Yes More and Company at yesmoreandco.com. Basically, about once a week, you get a text message that fe- features a, a product that you're probably predisposed to like. If you like it, you just text yes, and it shows up at your door in a couple of days. Just dead simple. Just I today just signed lunch. up for the wait list. Um, oh, nice. Um, uh, I, was, I was paying attention to the show. I, <laughs> it's that easy. That's I was how able to do two at once. <laughs> Uh, just just today at lunch, I, I used uh, some flatware and a uh, a dish scrubber that I got from Yes More and Company. So yeah, thank you, folks. yeah, yeah. it's I it's love real. It. It's real stuff. Uh, patrons, stick around for that extended show discussion. Today, we're going to talk about the backlash over Google's Olympic Gemini ad. Or is there much of a backlash? Another good example of how the internet alters the perception of public opinion. We're going to talk about that. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're always on demand, but we're also live. We go back tomorrow talking about what you do when your digital game store goes away with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)